your students organized a sit-down strike in the prison, and we think you're behind it. <laughs> now, when they hung up, I mean, I'll be quite honest, I just broke down. It was so powerful. They know they're not getting out of that prison. They know what can be done to them, what will, was done to them, and yet they rose up anyway. Tonight we present Chris Hedges in a provocative conversation with Now Magazine's Susan Cole. So let's get started. Chris, when I was uh, reading about revolution and reading about social change, analysis was really important. Intellectual pursuits were really important. You had to be really rigorous in making a lot of sense. And if you didn't, nobody was going to believe you. And yet you say, and it's emblazoned on the back of this book, there is nothing rational about rebellion. As an introduction to the book for our audience this evening, can you say a few words about that statement? Yeah, because when rebellion starts, and whether that was against the apartheid regime in South Africa, whether that was Castro and 53 rebels on the Granma landing, on the coast of Cuba, where most of them were immediately wiped out. Whether that was the anti-slavery movement, you have people, as Baldwin, James Baldwin writes, who are not so much striving towards a vision, but possessed by it. And this is a great essay by Baldwin, a writer I admire immensely, where he compares the rebel with the artist. And because the forces that you stand up against in, in this contemporary situation that would be, of course, corporate power are so immense and all its accoutrements, the security and surveillance state. Um, I think rebels are driven not so much by a belief that they will succeed, but by that quality of sublime madness, which is a term the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr uses Niebuhr writes that in moments of extremity, liberalism in, is an ineffectual force. Um, it's too tepid, it's too intellectual itself, um, and that you need what he calls this quality of sublime madness. And I think you see it in all of the great rebels throughout history. In fact, you make a distinction between intellectual and emotional knowledge. Right, and you know, which kind of characterized Niebuhr in many ways, who had the intellectual but not the emotional knowledge. Um, and it is that, I think, and I, I use that term in terms of confronting the catastrophe of climate change, where w many of us can have an intellectual knowledge that the ecosystem is disintegrating, but having that emotional knowledge of the fragility of our environment and the capacity uh, for it to disintegrate, and the consequences of that, for, especially for those we love, is much harder to acquire. But, you know, one of the really interesting things about this book is, of course, Chris isn't going to tell you what you need to make change without showing you why change is absolutely necessary. So, of course, the book is just laden with all of this devastating data about the income, in, income inequality, the devastation of the planet, um, how our governments are taking over uh, all of our private information, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it is actually very easy to, to get overwhelmed by that. Well, that is the great existential issue of our time, which is to ingest the reality around us, both intellectually and emotionally, and yet rise up and resist. And that's why I think that understanding that rebellion is an act of faith, that it's not about what we achieve, but about what, through rebellion, we are able to become. And at the end of the book, I uh, use a uh, a kind of call to faith, and I don't mean faith in any kind of an orthodox sense. I mean, this is, uh, you know, rebels have kind of uh, a faith that stands outside of religious doctrine, um, but it is the belief that the good calls to it the good, or draws to it the good, 
uh, at least insofar as we can determine the good, and then we let it go, that the Buddhists call this karma, um, but it is the faith that it goes somewhere, even if empirically everything around us points to uh, failure. Now, you see in the book that it's not a coincidence that many of the activists who have engendered great change are actually people of faith. Right. And it's actually, for those of us, it's almost a counterintuitive idea. We think of people who have strong religious beliefs, not spiritual beliefs, because I make that distinction, but religious beliefs as, 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 posit as po possibly reactionary. And yet you say, no, 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 um, that in fact, you can have a certain kind of religious faith and still push for radical change. Yes, because I think that you, what, what happens is that if you define yourself by your belief system and by that fealty to a belief system, then uh, you're less susceptible to the emotional highs and lows uh, that take place. And that it's more about living a life of fealty to that belief system. I'm just over there, I've got the third volume I'm finishing of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's masterpiece, Gulag Archipelago, and he makes the same point, exactly the same point in the camps. I was just in uh, the Supermax prison on death row in, Ohio, in the state of Ohio with a guy named Sadiq Hassan, who in 1993 led the prison uprising in Lucasville. Now, uh, he, was about, he was about to be released, and he was the kind of prison imam. Uh, and it was a particularly brutal prison. Uh, the, he, he wasn't in, in Lucasville, where they were uh, taking guards who were mostly white, were taking the prisoners who were mostly black, down into the hole and beating them to death. We just had a case like this in New Jersey. I teach in a prison, so I'm kind of close to this. Uh, and then claiming they had a heart attack and died, this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, there were all sorts of issues, you know, aside from the brutality. And the final straw was that they decided they would come in and vaccinate. Uh, and, uh, and so the Muslim community objected because of the contents in the vaccination. Uh, and yet they tried to force them anyway, and they sparked an uprising. Now, what was, uh, it, was a, it was a Muslim-led, the whole prison ended up rising up, and they built uh, relationships. It was a strong Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, and the way they did it was because the Muslim, the black Muslims were the majority, once they took the guards prisoners and captured uh, a large section of the prison, they called the Muslims down for prayer in the gymnasium. And they said to everyone else in the prison that they had to be respectful while the Muslims were carrying out their prayer. And then at the end, they said, and because you were, we will give you the same respect for anybody else who wants to carry out their own religious tradition. And that fused this unlikely bond between the Aryan Brotherhood, a white supremacist group, and the black Muslims. And when the guards retook the prison, the graffiti were white and black together, one race, convict race. And I don't think that it's accidental that it came out of a very deeply religious community, I see it in the prison that I teach. Um, when you sink to that level of extremity, um, you have so little to hold on to for your own dignity, your identity, and your self-worth. I saw it in Gaza, where I would go into the refugee camps, and um, I had a working relationship with Hamas, and I knew very well the two leaders, Rantisi and then later Nizaran, both killed in targeted assassinations. In the case of Nizarayan, the assassination took place in his home and killed his wife and all his children as well. Um, but when you would go to a refugee camp, here you had young men, they couldn't leave Gaza, a sleeping tent to a room, there wasn't clean water, there wasn't work. Um, it was a, you know, the only thing that gave structure and meaning to their lives was a call to prayer five times a day. And that structure was so potent and so powerful that I could walk through Haniunis, one of the most densely crowded and poorest refugee camps on the planet, at one in the morning and never be in any way touched or bothered. And, and I think that, that uh, James Cone, the great theologian, uh, writes about this in The Cross and the Lynching Tree, uh, which is a brilliant book. Um, when you sink to that level of despair, 
uh, it, 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 those belief systems are all you have that hold you together, which is part of my anger at uh, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, because I come out of those refugee camps and the idea that you would taunt or that it's amusing to sit in the indolence of the first world as a privileged European, white European, and make fun of the prophet Muhammad, and then having been in these refugee camps or been in these prisons, and understanding that that's, that is the very thin line, that's all they have between uh, any kind of sense of self-worth and dignity and, and utter and profound despair. So um, I think that faith is important. I think that faith, you know, and, and uh, you know, revolutionaries, even, you know, Marxist revolutionaries have their own secular version of faith, the belief in inevitable, you know, historical, uh, progress, um, but faith is, 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 I think, kind of essential, especially given, given what we're up against. And how has your faith influenced your thinking? Well, quite profoundly. I mean, I was raised in, my father was a minister, my mother was a seminary graduate, and I was, am a gradu graduated from Harvard Divinity School. So, I mean, I, it, it is, you know, although I'm not a particularly orthodox Christian in any way. Um, I mean, I certainly understand that God is a human concept uh, and that the universe is morally neutral. I covered the war in Bosnia. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, I think that that, what I spoke of earlier, that call to carry out the good and the belief that the good goes somewhere even if you can't see any evidence of that is for me really the definition of faith. Um, you know, I, I fight fascists, not because I will win, but because they are fascists. I, I do want to let the Charlie Hebdo go, thing go without asking you, forgive me if I just veer off the book for a second, but I take it you were in support of the 200 writers who... Oh, I didn't know it was that funny. I okay. wasn't. Well, <laughs> well, I take it you were with the 200 writers who protested the I Penn was, decision. I was, and uh, I would have uh, signed the letter as a member of Penn, but I had already resigned from America Penn uh, because this director, Nossel, came out of the State Department and did not oppose torture or preemptive war and has no business running a human rights organization. It was, it was a protest of one, but I did make it. Um, and so after I made it... John, John Ralston Saul arranged for me to become a member of Canadian Pen. So I am <laughs> now, I am a member of Pen, which is Canadian, Canada Pen. so. Um, I, I want to, uh, you, you make a point when, still on the subject of, I mean, I'm not, I'm, press, I'm not pressing the faith button, but I think that you need to believe in something to want mm. to take action. And I, I just want to talk a little bit about your comment about the fact that most people, which are those people who don't really want to change anything, don't want to change anything because their religion is a belief in the system. And I have talked, especially if I may say so with Americans, who I find positively delusional mm -hmm. about the extent to which they think they have a, f a free press, which is, I mean, right. look who owns everything, right? right. But, but I think too that while we're talking about what propels people forward in the, in the movement for social change, it's as important to talk about what keeps people doing nothing. Right. And, and, and you refer, I really liked that construction of the idea that belief in the system is, is now a religion. Sure, and it, it is, uh, I mean, America's religion is, it's, hyper-masculine patriotism, strength, um, the belief that we have a right to use violence and force to impose what we consider our virtues on the rest of the world. That's a form of religion. I mean, you look at American Sniper, which uh, certainly would have received five stars from Joseph Goebbels. Um, <laughs> and in theaters around the country um, where this psychopath is blowing away literally women and children, 
were Muslim, you know, they were cheering. And um, it's become, you know, the highest, the highest virtue in American society is embodied in our veneration of the military. It's very frightening. Um, I mean, you, you can go through airports in Dallas or in the South, and if there are service people walking through, you know, people will clap and you'll get on a plane and, um, and that is a form of religion, without question. It's a sacralization of, of empire. You know, you come in, in most of the, the data in here, although some of the uh, rebels are from other places in the world, but a lot of the data that you bring to us are, is from the United States. And I'm curious um, as to what, whether you do think, and here you are in Canada, um, is there a difference? Do you yeah. think there's more hope here than there? Because I can give you all kinds of reasons why right. I'm worried. <laughs> well, no, I'd be pretty worried. Um, but, but there's no hope in the United States. I mean, we're finished. And uh, in Canada, um, I mean, it is remarkable that America will uh, make, you know, one blunder after another and then um, with horrible consequences and then Canada decides to replicate it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're about to pass, it looks like, an anti-terrorism law that is as bad as anything we have yeah. I, I want to talk about Bill C-51 because, yeah. you know, it gives, it expands the, the whole definition of what's security. It creates a no-fly list that's private. It's, it's, it's pretty terrifying. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad you're here because I, I do think that what you're talking about in this book, and there's extensive sections on the extent to which um, people's privacy rights in the United States are you know, pretty soon going to be non-existent. But, but we have fears, too, here that, well, uh, global, that the prime minister yeah, is, is going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's a global system, but there's a couple major differences. One, we are a very, very violent culture, and Canada is not. Um, you know, the level of violence in America, I mean, we can just start with school shootings. You know, it's insane. And uh, gun ownership... Uh, vigilante violence has long been a part of American culture. Uh, we are a nation that is founded on genocide and slavery, and as Faulkner understood, that is kind of our original sin, and yet we don't deal with it, um, which perpetuates it. Um, I mean, in Canada, your, your political system is not completely closed. In America, it's a corporate two-party duopoly, and I worked for Nader I was a speechwriter in 2008. I love Ralph Nader. I think he's wonderful. Um, <laughs> I once gave a talk at the University of Wisconsin, and one of the students said, well, I like Nader, but his speeches are so boring. <laughs> Actually, I never found his speeches boring. I couldn't believe well, the radical no, words that were coming out of his them. mouth I wrote on a national lot of television. Them, so, uh, now I understand why, <laughs> what, what he was talking about. Um, <laughs> nobody understands corporate power in America better than Nader. Mm -hmm. And it was what was fascinating and terrifying was watching Nader be destroyed primarily by the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Because Nader's ability to poll uh, roughly 4 million votes in 2000 frightened them immensely. And they, I mean, they blamed him for losing Florida, which is patently ridiculous since they stopped the counting after two counties, and they moved it to the Supreme Court where they overturned all legal precedent and appointed George Bush president by fiat. Um, I mean, it, but th it, they challenged his voting list, so Patty Smith and I were running around raising money for Ralph, you know, trying to pay off, because they were just swamping him with legal fees. You just dropped a name. I did. I, did. <laughs> I just want you to know. Um, um, but she, but, but Nader, Nader was, and, and the reason Sanders won't run as an independent is, I mean, as he told me, is that he won't, he doesn't want to end up like Ralph. He under, you know, when you're on the inside, you realize that, you know, he, you can't get on the debates, you can't get money, you get locked off, uh, 
you know, off the voting list. I mean, it's, and, and the Canada has not gone that far. I mean, you have the NDP, because they just took Alberta, we'll see what they do. Um, uh, Leave it. And you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have the backing of multimillionaires in order to run for office. Well, we don't um, have unlimited ability to raise funds, yes, for... Right. So, I mean, there, there are signs of life here, <laughs> uh, but, it, but, yeah, you're not going in a good direction. Well, in fact, we mentioned Bill C-51. I also want to mention the Prime Minister's Law and Order campaign to do whatever he can despite the data, and he's data-phobic, as we all know. He's eliminated the, the census, and any kind of data terrifies him because it doesn't take him to the place he wants to go. And he's got a new law out. Again, he's going to deport everybody who's ever been charged, and he's doing what he can to fill our prisons, even though, from a financial point of view, it's a really bad idea. Uh, but I, so, I, so it's worth it, and I think instructive for us to hear a little bit about exactly what's been happening with the American prison system. Right. Well, actually, um, it isn't. If you're a corporation, it's a great idea to fill the prisons, because if you're a poor person living in a marginal community, uh, you're worth very little to the corporate state, since there aren't any jobs. But if you're locked in a cage, you can generate forty or fifty thousand dollars. But a that's year. because you've privatized the prisons in the United States. Not, we haven't done that quite yet here. All right, the money but, will come from the federal government. Right, but not that. We the private prison industry in the United States is a ninety billion dollar a year, or ninety million, probably ninety million dollar a year. But where they make their money is because all the commissaries are privatized. The phone companies, which charge usury exorbitant rates are privatized. Um, they no longer give out, like for instance in the prisons, of, I teach in a maximum security prison in New Jersey, and they won't give you shoes now. You have to buy your shoes. So you earn $1.30 a day working in prison. That's about $28 a month. The Reeboks that they sell you cost $45. Every single medical visit they charge you for, legal fees they charge you for, if you want to put money on your commissary account, it has to go through a private company called JPay. So if you send $20, they charge you a $495 fee. Um, they now charge, if you go, want to visit an immediate relative who is either dying or has died, you get a 15-minute visit. That's a, either a viewing or a deathbed visit. And they charge you overtime for the guards. It costs $900. It's endless. And every single year, they don't give out blankets anymore. They don't give out thermals anymore. And, and I've watched it. Year after year, as they strip more and more. And these corporations preying on the most vulnerable, these families, which have lost, in many cases, their primary wage earner, are frantic. Um, in, and, uh, and the system itself, because these corporations write the legislation, uh, is beholden to these corporations that are profiting off the system. What we're seeing is uh, an increasing number of uh, sweatshop, labor-intensive industries being recruited by prison administrators to come back into the prison system because they say, look, you don't have to go all the way to Bangladesh to pay someone 22 cents an hour. You can do it right here in the United States. And in fact, um, there was a time when the first analyses came out that declared that slavery, as the United States knew it in the, in the, you know, in, in the old days, was in fact integral to the American economy. We're just, you it's, refer to what's going is. on in prisons now it, as the new slavery. It's neo-slavery because under the 13th Amendment, you are allowed to use slavery as a form of, of punishment. And, uh, and so we now have most of the, the large corporations, I'm talking about Hewlett Packard, Johnson & Johnson, Starbucks, Target, Pierre Cardin, Victoria's Secret, the list is endless, are all in the prison system, and What's they... What's Victoria's Secret doing I in don't the prison know. system? I don't know. <laughs> well, I can kind of figure out what they're doing. But I have I mean... no idea. I mean, if you, call, if you call the Bureau of Tourism in the state of New Jersey, it's going to be a prisoner at the Edna May Correction Facility who's making 23 cents an hour answering your call. And so, I mean, I will let you in on a, hopefully this won't get back to the United States. 
Well, it's um, okay, there's only 800 people here. Right, I know, I know. But, but the fact is that it, it kind of fits with the thesis of the book that appealing to these systems, which are profiting off of the exploitation of the prisoners is useless. And that the only mechanism left is to carry out acts of civil disobedience inside and outside the prison. So a I was in Montana a couple weeks ago. I, I teach every Wednesday, and I got a phone call from the Special Investigation Division of the Department of Corrections in New Jersey and said, do you know that your students organized a sit-down strike in the prison, and we think you're behind it? <laughs> now, I don't know why. Um, now, that was, you know, what, when they hung up, I mean, I'll be quite honest, I just broke down. It was so powerful. Um, first of all, they'd waited for the day that I knew I wouldn't be there. And secondly, they know the consequences. They know they're not getting out of that prison. They know what can be done to them, what will, was done to them. And yet they rose up anyway. And um, any time you rise up, even within the confines of a maximum security prison, it terrifies the authority in the way that Occupy terrified everyone on Wall Street. And that's not conjecture because I have cousins on Wall Street and not only were they getting tweets every few minutes, so they're marching with puppets you know, down the street, <laughs> um, but they would, eat, they would eat their lunch at the desk because they didn't want to go outside. I mean, most of the people in Zuccotti Park were yoga practicing, dumpster diving vegans mm -hmm. um, uh, who were, no, but it was fascinating to see how unsettled they were, and I think partly because they know how gamed and corrupt the system is. So uh, one of the things that is a, a kind of nascent movement in the United States, and I'm not saying I have anything to do with it, is about organizing prison labor to receive the minimum wage because if they receive the minimum wage, the entire system collapses because it's built on neo-slavery. And I think that's a perfect example. It's a perfect example of how we have to organize in that manner rather than appeal to a system that is utterly beholden to corporate power. Now, you, you know, the President Obama and the former President Clinton come under very heavy scrutiny in this book. <clears throat> and it's interesting to me because I'm, I am one of those radically thinking people who think liberals are more dangerous than the right wing, personally. Um, that's a, a strong statement, but I, but I actually think it's true. But it, it's worth noting, and I'd like you to elaborate a bit on the fact that, um, well, we always knew that Arkansas, when uh, Clinton was a governor, had more executions than any other state. And that, in fact, and please tell us more about the extent to which both presidents did more to fill prisons in the United States than anybody else. Well, Clinton passed. It was Clinton who exploded the prison population with the 1994 or 1993 omnibus crime bill and appropriated massive sums of money to rebuild, to build new prisons. It was Clinton who passed the drug laws. Now the drug laws I think are kind of key to understanding the rise of the security and surveillance state because with the drug laws you created in marginal communities what Hannah Arendt calls omnipotent policing. She writes about it in Origins of Totalitarianism vis-a-vis -vis the stateless. So she herself is picked up by the Gestapo, uh, held, I mean, almost didn't make it, um, stripped of her citizenship and ends up in France. So she's stateless. She has no rights. She has no papers. She's not a citizen, officially a citizen anywhere. And she watches the creation of these uh, police mechanisms, policing mechanisms that can prey on the stateless who have no rights in the way that these mechanisms prey on undocumented workers or the way they prey in the United States on uh, people of color who live in poor neighborhoods. 
Um, and, and it's coupled with a, a, a kind of legal disempowering of the citizen. So in the United States, we now, through our militarized police, uh, on a, a nonviolent drug warrant, this is common, at two in the morning, they will kick down the door of your apartment, they will burst into your apartment, and there will be children in there with long-barreled weapons. Um, you know, they will beat people, handcuff, take them away. And, um, and because of the massive use of informants, um, and these are people who want to lessen their sentences or mitigate their sentences, um, uh, people are, are kind of convicted even before they ever go to trial, but of course 94% don't even go to trial because they stack them with so many charges uh, that you know, most of which the police know they didn't commit, and then they bargain away eight of the charges or something. So it, the insanity now, I mean, in the system, for instance, I teach a guy who uh, was picked up, uh, offered a 16-month plea deal, and he said, I didn't do it. He went to court, they gave him 30 years. <clears throat> um, I teach a guy who was picked up at the age of 14, um, hauled into a police station. They wouldn't allow any of his family members in there. He was crying. It was 3 in the morning. They said, just sign, just sign. You can go home. It was a confession. He signed it. Um, they put him at the age of 14 on the upper tier of the county jail in Camden, New Jersey. And he sat there with adult you know, people who had been charged with felony convictions, that's where you put them on the top of the jail, with adults, until he was 16, he was found guilty based on that confession, and he's not eligible to go before a parole board until he's 70 years old. I mean, I can spend all night doing that. The entire system has criminalized poverty and preyed on the poor knowing that they have no resources. So. In the case of this student, he said, I just need money for a DNA test. I need, they don't have lawyer, he can't afford a lawyer, he can't get a DNA test. We just had a prisoner in another facility beaten to death. He was 28 years old. They returned his body to his family. So his face is completely broken, contusions, and the, uh, the report said that he died of a heart attack. And the family said, we want an autopsy. And they said, you have to pay $4,000 if you want an autopsy. And they don't have $4,000, so all we have are the pictures before they bury him. I mean, this is a daily occurrence. The kinds of uh, reasons that you see the uprisings in Baltimore and Ferguson. So not only do you find these corporations tied to the system of mass incarceration, because remember, they're preying on the families. It's the families that have to send the money. And they don't have the money. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're being fleeced for hundreds of dollars for the phone, and the primary connection between a parent in prison and their children is the phone. Hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's a system, and on the, and the outside, if they're not in the prison, you see it in places like Ferguson or Baltimore, through austerity, 30 to 40 percent of the revenue that municipalities raise in poor neighborhoods is raised by fining the residents, that's, that's much of what's behind Baltimore and Ferguson for ridiculous things like not mowing your lawn, right. you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, that's why you see somebody run from a car when they're stopped for, because their taillight's out, um, because they can go right back into prison. We are now watching prisoners being released from the system, thousands of dollars in debt, and they can't get jobs. Many of them have worked for years. They have no social security. They have no money. Um, and if they can't pay those back on time, they're right back in the system. So you go on Corrections Corporation of America, which is the private prison system, and they, on the website, say, we're really good investment. You can buy their stock in the New York Stock Exchange, although if you do, you are a slave owner. And, um, and, and we're a really good investment because there's 64% recidivism. I think the, the prison system, and you know who, who got this was Dostoevsky that you, can, you understand a civilization by looking at its prisons. And I think that that's true because the, 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 the workers inside the prison system are the ideal workers in the eyes of the corporate state. They show up to work on time. If there's any complaints or attempt on organizing, they're marched off to solitary confinement where they can be locked away for months or years until they go insane. Um, they... Uh, don't, you don't have to pay benefits of any kind. 
Um, and, and, and I think that, and this is much the theme of Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, the book I did with Joe Sacco, that this is the vision that unfettered, unregulated capitalism would like for the rest of us. And they are slowly stripping away whatever protection we have, you know, so those on the outside begin more and more to replicate those on the inside. Huh. <laughs> um, I, no, I asked, and, and, and I cautioned about being overwhelmed, too, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I want to make sure that um, our audience knows that there are some incredible portraits of very brave people in this book, and we haven't had a chance to go through them all, Chris. Um, I mean, if I had three hours, we'd be, it'd be great, I, I don't. But I wanted to mention three in particular who are controversial and ask you some questions that'll help those of us in the audience respond. I mean, for myself, for example, I do a radio show in, in, in mornings and have to deal with a right-wing guy who has, never mind. But if I mention the name Edward Snowden, for example, he says, Edward Snowden did more to put American troops in danger than anybody else. How do you respond to that claim? It's bullshit. Good. <laughs> Edward, Edward Snowden had the name of every NSA employee, every NSA station. He could have shut down the entire intelligence operation at the flick of a switch, and he didn't do it. He exposed criminal behavior on the part of the government in the hopes that we would respond. So um, that's just factually untrue. And they've made the same charge about Chelsea Manning, of course. Now let's talk about Julian Assange because um, those, you, you mentioned it in a subordinate clause, but it kind of clicked for me as a feminist who was concerned when the charges of uh, sexual assault came up with respect to Julian Assange. You kind of dismissed it very quickly, but I mean, those of us who want to support him um, our instinct is to go, you know, wait a second. And we, you know, we did it with that guy, Gian Gomeshi, too. We all said, wait a second, right? Well, so, I, didn't, I didn't support him. I thought, I didn't like the show, so. Ah, uh, <laughs> he knew I thought it was an embarrass. I, I thought it was that. an embarrassment to the CBC. All right. So. But, but can you talk, talk to us a little bit about the Julian, just uh, because you did say they're not, um, they're unsupported charges, or they were kind of trumped up. But it would help well, us to know I mean, a little want, more. I know. I mean, I read the case. Do you want the dirty details of exactly what happened in Sweden? I mean, he was a pig. Um, he's not the first male to be a pig. Um, it wasn't rape. It was consensual sex. Um, he was sleeping with a woman, and, you know, he had that kind of celebrity status that he used inappropriately. And then he started sleeping with someone else, and she found out about it, and this created, uh, you know, obviously among both of them, a great deal of justifiable anger. Scorned woman, is that what you're saying? Well, it was, he, you know, he didn't use a condom when he should have. Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm not defending the action, of course, um, but the, the larger point, and this was part of my problem with Alex Gibney's film on Assange is this notion that he's hiding out in the Ecuadorian embassy because of the Swedish charges. Um, this is just an extremely naive view of power. Um, if you don't think the United States wants to lynch Julian Assange just like they lynched Chelsea Manning and just like they want to lynch Edward Snowden, then you really don't understand the, the workings of power especially Assange. And um, I think there is enough anecdotal evidence that suggests that there is a sealed grand jury indictment, um, which is how we do it in the American legal system. So you, the charges are all there, but they're secret, so that the person who is charged doesn't know about it. But the moment they step out where they can be uh, captured, um, then those charges are open. We've seen that happen with jihadists in Somalia and places like that. So um, that's, my, that's my critique of those who essentially try to use those charges uh, as a way of saying that Assange's fear is not justified. And I think that's completely wrong. Um, I think maybe one of the messages from this is that people are complex and there's no such thing as a perfect hero. And one of your 
um, rebels that you um, talk about is, is our own Weibo Ludwig, who you'll, many of you will remember as the Albertan who was blowing up various gas wells because they were polluting, well, they were producing sour gas that was having a serious um, impact on not only the animal life on his farm, but the um, actual, there was members of his family who were having miscarriages because of it. Uh, he was presented uh, by the media as a, t a terrorist and a patriarch. And I have to say that I had my own interaction with Ludwig because I had interviewed him for a cover story at Now Magazine because I was interested in him as a radical. And it, we had this quite funny exchange because I purposely mentioned that I was a lesbian, assuming that he would hang up the phone. And in fact, foolish me, of course he did the opposite, which was to spend 15 minutes trying to convince me to stop being a lesbian. <laughs> um, he failed. Uh, but, but it made it very clear to me that he was you know, a patriarch with certain you know, reactionary ideas. Um, but as, coming back to the faith thing, he, he definitely had enough faith to believe that he was going to convince me, which I, I, you know, I, was, I found it a little bit endearing at the, at the point. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I was, um, he, was, he was two things, right? And that, that, that things aren't so simple when, you, when you're looking for well, heroes, right? You know what, what Martin Luther said, our, our greatest sin is our greatest strength. And there's someone who should know, Luther. Um, you know, not only one of the most arrogant human beings in history, a rabid anti-Semite, but a phenomenal alcoholic. He became famous early on, and so scribes followed him around and recorded everything he said, including when he was roaring drunk. So he's one of the few historical figures where we have probably a complete picture of his subconscious, um, which is not pretty. Um, and I think Ludwig embodies that messianic, and messianic figures are difficult They're figures. They're messy figures. Yeah. Messy, messianic and, figures. Um, and yet, they are those who can rise up. I mean, I know Julian and like him very much, but he's an eccentric, not surprisingly ornery, and I, I like him, uh, but difficult personality. Um, I mean, unlike Snowden, Assange has been rebelling since he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. in very serious and often very dangerous ways. And, um, and people who have that type of personality are by nature difficult and yet, you know, amazing. And Ludwig, in that sense, you know, he tried to appeal to the authorities. He wrote letters. He went to the regular. He did, but we forget that. There was a no, long No, he definitely of, tried to right. go through the system. And he realized the system that it was gamed and that these corporations were going to extract that sour gas no matter what. And it didn't matter how many people, women in his compound had miscarriages or animals, it didn't matter. And so he rose up. I mean, unfortunately, you know, again, you know, it's, it's, never, it's never a binary world of good and evil or black and white. He shoots a young woman, the people joy riding through his property and then covers it up. And, um, but, you know, he goes to, he reads Jacques Ellul, who I like, and you know he's not that he's not a simpleton in that sense. No, def definitely. Uh, yeah. Not. So, I think that those, I think he kind of embodies in a way those kinds. You, you don't want these people to run your country, um, but at the same time, you can't really have a rebellion without them. Che Guevara would be a perfect example of that. I mean, Che, who was brutal, he was Castro's enforcer in the Sierra Nevada. Sierra Madre, he, he, when they took power in Havana, you know, was in charge of the executions, but he was, you know, he had that DNA of constant rebellion. He could never fit in. You know, he's in the Congo and then ends in Bolivia. Uh, Ronnie Cus Reels, who founded the armed wing of the ANC, who I interview in the book, is another rebel. And so he ends up being Mandela's deputy defense minister but he, he sees the corruption in the ANC, he denounces his own party, which he spent 30 years fighting underground on behalf of, and then they carry out that massacre of the miners, the largest massacre since Sharpeville, and he denounces that, he denounces the economic inequality. That is the quality of rebels. They're kind of 
you know, e even if they're ever integrated into the power structure, they very swiftly become heretics. And yet no revolutionary, no uprising is possible without them. I'm going to open up the floor really soon, but I'm going to ask Chris a last question. So if you have a question for the great Chris Hedges, there's a microphone right here. Um, please step up to it. I'm going to give you some time while I ask him this last question, which is, I, I know this, you may not think this is your calling, but I've got six, 700, I don't know how many people are here, all of whom share your, I think, maybe there's a few dissidents in here, but all of whom share your, our passion for social change, our feeling really the need to, to do something. What would your advice be to them? Um, Lynn Stewart, for example, says find community. Right. I, I know that everybody's different, so I don't think you all have the same story. But I, I think that people want to be inspired. They want to feel like something's possible. What, what can you say? I think community people? is key. I don't think that you can effectively resist without it. And um, you need, that was part of the beauty of Zuccotti Park. And I would just go in and sit. The People's Library, 5,000 books, was tended mostly by retired New York City school librarians. And it was one of the most beautiful parts of the park. Um, and when they cr brought Zuccotti in, uh, when they brought the police in to crush the Occupy encampment, one of the things that I found afterwards people mourned the most was the fact that they destroyed all the books. They literally threw them on the ground and ran over them with dumpsters. Yeah. Yeah, it was fascinating that people mourned for that because what that park had done was create a community of people who had not had a community before. And given what we are about to face, community will be key. Um, there, I protested a couple years ago with Veterans for Peace about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in front of the White House, and 133 of us were arrested in front of the White House. And it, like all things, it's on YouTube. But the, so it's snowing, it's December, so there's a heavy snowfall, and um, right before everybody goes, and people are often in their dress uniforms, uh, right before they march to the fence, this great blues musician, Watermelon Slim, who himself is a Vietnam vet, plays taps on the harmonica as they fold the flag of a kid uh, who had just been killed in Afghanistan a week before. And then everybody falls completely silent, and there's a slow beating of the drum, and in a single file, people walk to that fence until they're arrested. And I can tell you, most of us were crying, um, because we know war. And it wasn't like we thought that getting arrested on the White House fence was gonna change the war or the policy, um, but it created that act of solidarity. I mean, I, I said to them, you know, you are my church. This is my church. Um, this is my sacrament. And what was so powerful was when we were taken down and handcuffed, it turns out most of the police are in the National Guard and have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they would cuff us, and it happened to me, and then they would whisper, keep protesting. Hmm. <laughs> and that, that terrifies the state. Um, and it is, as Václav Havel says in his great 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless, what it means to live in truth. And I think given the evil that is before us, these corporate forces in theological terms are forces of death. Given the evil that is before us, we have to find solidarity in community and we have to live in truth. And if we will stand up as these veterans did that day and live in truth, that moment itself will give us the power to resist and to live a life of resistance.
floor is open. Please, if you can, keep your questions brief. I will. I will. Mr. Hedges, uh, I'd like to better understand your respect for faith, which you've described as fealty to a belief system, which need not be grounded in reason or to a liberal conception of justice. You've said that this kind of faith provides a kind of psychological resilience, which, re uh, which aids rebels in facing their arduous challenges. But does it fealty to irrational belief systems, divorced from liberal conceptions of justice, play a central role in the greatest security threats that we face? To point to just one aspect uh, of this. I asked for a short question. Okay. I'm really sorry. But okay. yeah, you've got people waiting behind you, and I'm on the clock. So how, how long have I taken so far? How about uh, what? How long have I taken? Yeah, You're so, all, so it's the, already time to form a full <laughs> sentence with a question mark. OK, so the question is, um, isn't fealty to these kind of belief systems a much greater liability than any benefit it affords to certain rebels? Well, this is uh, part of the debate I've had with the new atheists, the late Christopher Hitchens. And debating Hitchens is not, it's not something I'd wish on anyone in this room. But, um, <laughs> and uh, Sam Harris, um, and it's not irrational, it's non-rational, and that's an important distinction. It is being in touch with those non-rational forces which are not quantifiable, which not, cannot be empirically measured, beauty, truth, justice, the struggle with our own mortality a life of meaning, love. And Freud said he could write about sex, he could never write about love. <laughs> and the Buddhists say that you can memorize as many sutras as you want, it will never make you wise. What makes you wise is to envelop those non-rational forces into your life and into your belief system. And that's what artists do. They seek to express and honor those forces that have the power to transform and change us. And if we are not, and, that, and, and you know, utilitarian, technological, corporate culture is about severing us from those forces. That's why they are making war on everything within our society that has to do with beauty and truth. Um, whether that's the arts, whether that's journalism, whether that's education, anything that has the power to transform is under assault. And so, for me, you can only achieve wisdom when you have the capacity to be in touch with the non-rational. Next question, please. You could drag it down, I think. How do you reconcile that the United States, which was founded on the principle of religious freedom and separation of religion and government, considers itself to be a Christian nation. And the Christian, what I call the Christian right, and I usually put another word before it, but that the very religious Christian right seems to support so many government positions that to me seem unchristian and also support the purchase of their government by big business. Well, I wrote a book about the Christian right. It's called American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America. I was trying to reach out to them. <laughs> and um, uh, my, my problem with the liberal church is that they have not denounced these people for who they are, and that's Christian heretics. Jesus did not come to make us rich, and you do not need to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School, as I did, to figure that out. And in the name of tolerance, we have accepted the intolerant. And as Karl Popper says, when you accept the intolerant, then soon tolerance disappears and the tolerant along with them. And the failure on the part of the liberal Christian tradition, which I come out of, to confront the Christian right, which has fused the iconography and language of the state with the iconography and language of the Christian religion that happened in Germany under the so-called German Christian Church is heretical. 
Um, and so I don't look at these people as co-believers. I look the, at them as heretics uh, who have essentially misused the Christian gospel to sacralize the most retrograde elements of corporate capitalism and American imperialism. Next question, please. Yes, uh, you have said that um, the, um, the um, uh, uh, we cannot look at black and white in terms of rebels. Um, I think you have a very Anglo-Saxon view of uh, rebellion à la Voltaire, as it is in Charlie Hebdo. And uh, you can be without faith and still be a rebel, as Voltaire has showed, and his uh, a generation further back did. Well, I would agree. I, I don't mean any kind of formal religious faith. I mean, if you look at, for instance, the Bolsheviks, uh, you know, especially before they seized power, uh, they had a kind of faith, a, a faith in their own destiny, a faith in the historical determinism that eventually would mean they tr would triumph. And it was, uh, it, it functioned as a religious system. And I think that that's often important, but I didn't mean in, I didn't mean in any way to say that you should all become Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Stephen Harper is surely an agent of one of, of the forces that destroyed America. And we have an election coming up in October. What practical advice do you have for all of us so that we can be <laughs> increase our activism to stop this man from destroying Canada? Um, I'm with Karl Popper in uh, the first volume of the Open, uh, the, uh, Open Society and Its Enemies. It's where he writes that it's... The question is not how do you get good people to rule, that that's the wrong question. Most people attracted to power, Popper rights are at best mediocre, which is probably Obama or Venal, which is Harper. Um, the question is how do you make the power elite frightened of you? And so thinking that somehow elections uh, are going to solve the problem uh, is once again to misread power. Power is always the problem. And what we have to do is build radical movements that keep power in check. That's our job. It's not our job to take power. It's our job to make power frightened of us. Um, so there's a moment in uh, Kissinger's memoirs, do not buy the book, um, <laughs> where it's 1971, Kiss, uh, Nixon has taken empty city buses and put them end to end all around the White House as barricades and he's looking with Kissinger through the window, wringing his hands, going, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that's just where we want people in power to be. So elections are fine. Um, that's why the last liberal president in the United States was Richard Nixon, not because he was a liberal or had a heart or a conscience, but because he was still frightened of movements. And we have to build radical movements that don't sell our souls to any political party. I mean, Idle No More, you've done it, the Quebec student movement. I mean, Canada, in some ways, is far ahead of us because those movements have to be sustained, as the Quebec movement was a good example, the students' movement. And, um, and we have to realize that once even those who we consider to be uh, amenable to our demands achieve power, they still have to be held in check and they still have to be made frightened of us. So uh, I've been talking a lot with a, a woman I admire very much, uh, Shama Sawan, who's the socialist city councilwoman in Seattle, and I'm going to open her campaign in Seattle on uh, June 6th. Um, and you can, the whole Democratic establishment, not just uh, the state of Washington, but nationally are trying to destroy her, obviously. Um, in the way that they destroyed Nader. But I think she has pointed out that we have to begin to build movements that like Cereza or like Podemos in Spain may have a political wing, but every action, including elections, is about building, increasing the strength of and nourishing the movement, not somehow believing that elections in and of themselves are going to save us.
I'm still voting NDP, uh, <laughs> just saying. I'm really sorry to say that this is the last question that we have time for tonight. My apologies to all of you who have waited. Um, uh, your question, please. That happened to me the last time that you spoke, so I'm glad I finally made it up. So I, I, I really, your idea of like madness really resonates with me. I'm fortunate enough to work um, with young people who are street involved, and so sometimes I really feel mad doing that work. <laughs> um, and I think that madness is really important. Um, but what I would like for you to speak a little bit to, and this reckons to what you spoke about at the Get Up Stand Up event two years ago, is you talked about how one of the mechanisms that power kind of undermines revolt or resistance is psychological and it kind of breaks you down as an individual and you talked about your experiences in relation to that. So I'm curious, what are some ways to manage that knowing that that is when you're, that's their, the power's technique against you as you're, as you're sort of resisting? And then in that context, how are you building community? Because there's such paranoia and insanity that sort of comes out of that as well. Where's the balance between sort of madness and this psychological warfare that's being waged against you? Right, well, the, the, what, what they want to do is destroy the capacity for community, and the way they do that, of course, all of these movements, and this is hardly limited to the United States, but includes Canada as well, have been, are not only heavily monitored, but have been heavily infiltrated. And that's why we will go back to Havel's great essay. That, that has been my struggle with the black bloc, um, which has gotten quite acrimonious um, I mean, they will protest outside halls I speak, and they all carry the same sign, which, is, which reads, fuck you, Chris Hedges. Um, that's useful. Well, that's kind of the level of political sophistication they reach. But the point is, we can't compete. We can't compete on the level of violence. We can't compete on the level of security. Um, so one of the kind of amusing aspects, you know, that everybody knew in Zuccotti. Um, the cops were, it was like a Doonesbury cartoon. I mean, there were guys who lifted weight in baseball caps who said they went to Reed College and, but <laughs> forgot their ID and walked around the crowd going, well, uh, where are the leaders? Who are the leaders? <laughs> who do you think the leaders are after like 10 minutes of chit chat? And so one of my friends was in the medical tent and one of these undercover cops came over and starts chatting and goes, well, do you know who the leaders are here? And she goes, I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he goes, wow. He said, well, what are you in charge of? She goes, everything. <laughs> he goes, do you have a title? She goes, God. <laughs> so you'd have 4,000 people in Zuccotti Park in a public meeting deciding on what they were going to action. It was a total waste of NYPD overtime to have cops there because they were broadcasting it. And I think that um, that, that transparency and nonviolence are the best weapons that we have because if we try and play the game, who's the, who's the snitch, who's the, um, we'll eat ourselves alive. Now that said, it, there are times when you can create tiny communities to mess with the head of the state, which I totally endorse. And so after Bloomberg made his first feint to take over the park, foolishly announcing it in advance so all the Teamsters were there ringing it, we knew that Bloomberg was going to come back, but this time there wasn't going to be a warning. Nobody knew when. So several members of the Direct Action Committee from Zuccotti came down to my house in Princeton and camped out all over the floor, which my children loved. And um, so all electronics, this was before Snowden, remember, all, you know, but there were, all of the electronics were put in the car, like all the phones, and nobody spoke. We only wrote messages back and forth, and then we burned them in my fireplace. And the thing was, to, what can we do as an act of resistance that when they come for this park, to shut down the park, they won't expect. And so those activists decided that they would get bike locks and chains and um, chain themselves to the kitchen area, which was in the center of Zuccotti. So when they came in to shut the park down, the police came in and there were 20 activists chained to the kitchen and they didn't have chain cutters. And it was a way to tell the state you don't know everything. And 
So I think that transparency, I think that's what, you know, nonviolence, because I'm not a pacifist. I was in Bosnia during the war. I, I, if I was a Sarajevan, like every other Sarajevan, surrounded by the Bosnian Serbs who were hitting the city with 2,000 shells a day and killing four to five people a day, and we knew from the Drina Valley in Vukovar that if they ever broke through these trenches, a third of the city would be slaughtered and the rest would be driven to displacement or refugee camps. So, I mean, I'm, I understand that there are moments when you face imminent extinction and you don't have an option. Um, but in this case, uh, the most powerful weapon we have is the fact that we are speaking a truth about a discredited, corrupt, and venal system of power um, that many of those inside the organs of security can hear. And I remember once speaking in Zuccotti Park and telling activists, well, don't taunt the police. And, um, and the, most of the harsh physical abuses were carried out by the white-shirted officers. And the whole demeanor of the blue uniform police would change when the white shirts came up. And I remember saying, it got on a YouTube video, of course, and I remember saying, to them, well, you know, we only have to deal with the white, these white-shirted assholes an hour to a day. These poor uniformed police have to deal with them all day long. And <laughs> a few months later, I was giving a talk in New York, and a guy came up with one of my books, and he said, I'm a white-shirted asshole, <laughs> and I read your books. Well, he's probably the only one, but nevertheless, I mean, I'd read King. I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. And because there's always people, even at that level within the system, they're ob obviously not a majority, who can hear you. you. You may not think seeing those white shirts out in Zuccotti, and he may have been there, would have never occurred to me that he would have heard a word I said. Um, and I think that because we are speaking an undeniable truth, because we are standing up in a very concrete sense for the forces of life, and we're, let's, you know, in terms of saving the ecosystem so that future generations can actually have a life. Um, that this is a battle, you know, you know and I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not a Manichaean, but this is about as stark a battle as you can get. And our capacity to be disciplined, our capacity to speak truth relentlessly, no matter what they do to us, and our capacity to be nonviolent. Um, means that I think we have a very real, if we rise up, a very real possibility of bringing many of the foot soldiers who protect these corrupt elites to our side. And as Crane Brinton and Davies and other theorists on revolution have pointed out, no revolution succeeds unless a certain segment of the security apparatus defects. And most revolutions are nonviolent in this sense that it's when the Cossacks go into the Petrograd bread riots and refuse to use their usual force to put it down, the Tsar's over. When Eric Honecker in East Germany sends down an elite paratroop division, I was there, to Leipzig to fire on the crowd, they refuse to do it, he doesn't last another week in power. When Somoza's National Guard defects, he's off Done. to Uruguay. When uh, the Shah's army will no longer defend him, it's over. So, and I think that Part of the reason, and I'll just end here, uh, that, I, uh, uh, that they passed Section 1021, I don't know if you know that I sued Barack Obama in federal court over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which Obama passed two years ago, which overturns over 150 years of domestic law and allows the military to carry out domestic policing on American soil, um, to seize American citizens, strip them of due process, and hold them indefinitely in military facilities. We won, actually, in the federal court, and then Obama appealed, and it was, it was unfortunately overturned. But I think the reason that they passed that law is because ultimately they don't trust the police to protect them. Uh, and you can see it not only in the, when we were arrested in front of the White House, but if you remember with Chicago, with the Chicago teachers strike, so the teachers would be marching through the streets, and every time they would go into the precincts, the police would applaud. And that terrifies the state. So, um, you know, all of these 
foot soldiers like these cops in New York, they're on off-duty, they rent themselves out for security for $37 an hour. So they're standing in the lobby of Goldman Sachs watching these guys in their $5,000 suits get in there. They know. They know. And, um, and the state is that corrupt and that decadent um, that if we have the capacity to rise up in a sustained way um, and throw ourselves in front of the system and you know, go into jails more time than I care to donate to my government, um, but I don't think we have an option. My friend Cornell West is getting arrested as we speak, by the way, in Baltimore. Um, I think that that's what we've got to do. And um, there's, uh, I'll just end by, you know, I, 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 oh, I, I've given up ever trying to look hip, so I would march in these Occupy things in my button-down shirt, and there's actually a picture before I was arrested in front of, block, we blocked the entrance of Goldman Sachs. Um, and so I'm marching down the street with 300 protesters, all of whom are tattooed and pierced, and, um, and I'm there, you know, <laughs> looking like the prep school graduate that I was. And, um, but that's where I find hope. That's where I find life. That's where I find creativity. What's coming out of Ferguson is amazing. Um, you know, Jesse Jackson was booed when he went to Ferguson. <laughs> they don't have any time for it. They invited the hip-hop artist from Ferguson, uh, T. Dub O, to the White House, and Obama said, did you vote for me? And he goes, you've done nothing for black people. I haven't voted for you. And to vote for you because you're black would be shallow. Now, that is a level of sophistication that liberal elites in the United States have yet to achieve. Um, and that's coming off the streets of our cities. Um, so... Uh, I'm energized, and I'm given hope, I'm empowered and blessed by this new generation of rebels, and, um, and uh, I'll, I'll be right with you. <laughs>